I've been doing Affinity Photo videos since 2018. In that time, I've seen one problem mentioned more frequently than any other. It's that my Affinity Photo looks different, and so people assume I'm using a different version. In this video, I'll explain why that assumption is wrong and what's going on. But first, we need to go back to the 1980s, when I was first involved in software development. Back then, very few people used a computer. And that's why the first chapter in most software manuals explained the user interface. We knew that if people didn't understand the interface, they wouldn't be able to use the software. But today, with computers being commonplace, there's an expectation that people understand the user interface automatically. That's fine with simple applications, but not with something like Affinity Photo, where you can customise most everything in there. Now for this video, I'm using Affinity Photo version 2.3. If you want to check your version of Affinity Photo, click the Affinity Photo menu on a Mac, and then the About option. On a Windows PC, I think the About option is under the Help menu, but it's been a long time since I've used it on Windows. Then, when you want to close the information dialog, click inside the dialog with your mouse. The next thing that's unusual about Affinity Photo is that it's organised into something called personas. We access these using the icons along the top left of the interface in the toolbar. You can think of the persona as being almost a separate application with a specific purpose. Most of the time, most people only need to use the photo persona, which is what we see here. This is the default persona when opening an image for editing like a JPEG or a TIFF image. But photographers who shoot and edit with RAW files might also need to use the develop persona. In fact, the only way we can edit a RAW file with the software is to first convert them into an image using the Affinity Photo develop persona. But in addition to RAW files, the develop persona can also be used to edit regular pixel images like JPEGs. When I click the icon, we can switch to the develop persona, where we can adjust this image. Notice the tools on the left of the interface are organised into a tools palette. You'll see this tools palette in each of the personas, but it's different in each of them. Then, over on the right, we have more tools organised into tabs, which we call Studio Panels. Let's cancel this now to return to the default Photo Persona, because that's the best place to explain the user interface. As with the Develop Persona, we can see the collection of tools organised into the Tools Palette on the left. Now there's a good chance that if you compare your Tools Palette with mine, you'll see some differences. That's because many of these tools are in groups, which is indicated by the small grey triangle to the bottom right of the icon. If we click the centre of the icon, we select that tool. But when we click the grey triangle, we see the tools in the group. Now we can click the one that we want to use, and that icon appears in the tools palette. But this isn't the only reason your tools may look different. We can also change the tools that appear in the palette by selecting the View menu and then the Customize Tools option. This opens a dialog where we see all possible tools for this persona. Many of these tools aren't visible in the Tools palette by default, but we can add them by dragging them and dropping them with our mouse. You can even create more space in the palette by increasing the number of columns. There's also a useful button to reset the tools to the default layout. Let's close that now, because there's another way to change the tools palette appearance, which is easy to do by mistake. Watch what happens when I double click the bottom of the palette. Suddenly it becomes a floating panel arranged into two columns. I've known new users to do this without realising what they've done. If you want to return to the regular Tools palette, double-click the Tools title. Which brings us rather nicely onto another interface feature that often confuses new users. The Studio Panels on the right of the screen. These act like tabs which we can select by clicking with our mouse. When I click one of the tabs, that panel is then displayed. This area is just a collection of Studio Panels grouped together, but we can move them around. When I click and drag with my mouse, I can remove this panel so that it then floats over the interface. 
then to put it back into a group, I can drag and drop it over the group using my mouse. It's also possible to reorder the panels in the group in the same way. Now let me show you something else with this panel. I can use it to create a completely new group. Watch what happens as I drag it between two existing groups. The area becomes highlighted by a blue rectangle. This indicates where a new group will be created when I release the mouse. Now we have four groups on the right of the interface rather than three. To go back to three groups, I just click and drag the panel away. With this level of flexibility, it's no wonder that people's interfaces look different and that can be very confusing. But when you understand how to configure everything, it suddenly becomes less confusing. Now supposing we don't want the stock panel cluttering up our interface because we never use it. All we need to do to close it is click the small cross icon. But we only see this when the panel or group is floating, we don't see it when it's docked. That's when we can use an alternative method of closing it in the Windows menu. Here we see a list of panels available with the current persona. There's a similar list in other personas, but the list is different for each. Now notice the tick mark to the left of some panels. It indicates that these panels are currently visible. Panels that are hidden, like the stock panel, don't have a tick mark next to them. But if we click this now in the list, it becomes visible again. We then see the tick mark in the Windows menu. As you can see, there are lots of different studio panels in the photo persona, and most are hidden by default. These panels group tools, features, and assets that you might need when editing. But if they're hidden, it can be difficult to find what you're looking for. Take the example of adding a sunburst effect to this image. I know that I have some lens flare effects that I bought on the Affinity website, but I can't see them anywhere. That's because they're stored in the asset panel, which isn't visible. When I turn that on, I can see the effects that I want to use, which I can then drag and drop onto my image. But there's something else with this panel that probably hasn't escaped your attention. It's on the left of the interface and not the right, like the other panels. Don't let this confuse you, it works just like the other panels. We can still drag and drop it, as well as dock other panels with it on the left. These areas on the left and right of the interface are called the left and right studio. Another common problem is caused by being able to hide both of these studio areas using the window menu. When we click that, we see a studio option. That has a submenu where we see the option to show the left and right studios. Notice these have tick marks next to them, like the panels. Click one and it toggles the visibility off, hiding all the panels there. Then if we open the same menu and click it a second time, it toggles it back on. There's also a useful option in the studio menu if you find your interface becomes a mess. Click the Reset Studio option and everything returns to the default layout. If you can remember the things we've covered in this video, it will make learning Affinity Photo much easier. As will this next video, which is the start of my free Affinity Photo course. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't, and check out the link to my free book in the YouTube video description below. I'll see you soon for another video.